Welcome to Crime Most French, a weekly podcast taking you through intriguing cases carried out on French soil. Research and narrated by Cedric and rudely interrupted by me, Melanie. We're the true crime podcast on the lines. Crack open le vin and let the mayhem commence. The episode this week is the second part of the Omar Radad affair. In the previous episode, if you haven't seen it, go and listen to it. Well, listen, no, not seen it, if you haven't listened to yes. it. If you haven't listened to it, go and listen to it. Um, we saw that uh, Gisèle Marshall, Marshall, an old lady, probably rich, um, was killed in her own basement. That she had written, apparently, on the walls the name of her killer. That her presumed killer was arrested but there was a whole bunch of problems with the investigation, like going to the wrong place, talking to the wrong people, ignoring obvious evidence, or using evidence either way in disfavor of the defendant. So that was already a circus, and we are now going to talk about the trial and what happened later, which is where the crazy part starts. I think uh, the one thing we should really point out uh, from last time is the overall impression I got was um, the actual uh, accused was working. Uh, He was a gardener um, who was a Berber who had very little English. French. Yeah, sorry, yes. (laughs) Very little French. I know how he feels. Um, And he had... A very kind of like close relationship with two of his employers, one of which was the the victim. Yes. I think that's ultimately uh, quite important to remember that uh, he wasn't just some kind of gardener who flitted in and out. I think he actually lived um, on the property at one point. Yes, he lived above the yeah. one of the victims, the victim's yeah. garage for yeah. a while with his wife. So, yeah, so go and listen to the first episode. Basically, yeah. <laughs> so awaiting trial, Omar does a hunger strike, a strike in 1991. Mm-hmm. Um, he doesn't eat for 36 days and he only starts eating again because his dad is asking him to. All right, okay. So, I mean, he's obviously got a lot of conviction. Yes. Then still awaiting trial... His lawyer tries to get bail for him. Mm-hmm. He, the, uh, the lawyer argues that the prosecution has a case that is very thin on proof, which mm. we've talked about before. Yes. That there are several holes in their story. We've talked about those before. Mm-hmm. And that so far, all they have are empty accusations. And we've talked about these press um, leaks between Ebony's. Yes. Um, that came probably from somewhere on the low side. Yeah. That were just feeding crap to the press, essentially trying mm-hmm. to get him convicted in the uh, in the press before the trial. Yeah. So muddying. the lawyer argues all that. Yeah, muddying the waters before yeah. the. Uh... And he says, therefore, my client needs to be let out on awaiting trial. Yeah. It's rejected. Of course. Hom- Omar's lawyer tries again a couple of months later. Mm-hmm. But a few days before the the hearing, a local newspaper publishes information between the Albanese from a source close to the inquiry that uh, a new set of tests have shown dust traces on Omar's clothes that point to his involvement in the murder. Despite the fact that the results of the tests haven't been officially published yet. Mm -hmm. The same newspaper wonders if this is anything other than a scheme from the prosecution to block the release request a few days later using vaporware. So because basi- we, we've seen that the press originally uh-huh. says everything they're told yes. by the gendarmerie or the prosecution or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then at some point they realize that they're being lied to when they, they try to compare actual results of tests to what they were told they were in advance. Mm-hmm. And they realize they're exactly the opposite. And at that point, the press turns against the, the prosecution and the gendarmerie. And at that point, that's where we are. So the press repeats what they are told, but now they say, mm, we're not sure that's true. So it's, it's in fact had a, the exact opposite effect of muddying the water for, for the actual prosecution. It might actually hurt um, the case for the prosecution because now the press you would are think so, questioning yes. it. 
Yeah, you would think so. Yeah. But you you're forgetting that the the whole law side of the story is convinced that he's guilty. Of course, yeah. So so what? But I'm also forgetting as well. I mean, is it going to be a jury case or is it just a judge? Yes. Yes, it's a jury case. Oh right, okay. So well, yeah. it might still be worth trying to clarify things in the press. Then in that case, yeah. But what do these tests show? In fact, they show very, very little. Mm-hmm. They show that they show that there are some fiberglass glasses on Omar's trousers. Right. That the prosecution says prove that Omar was in the basement on the day of the murder. The tests show that these traces don't match the rock fibers that are found in the basement. So in fact, it, it so they, in fact, like they show nothing useful. That he wasn't there then yeah. in that case. Yes. So what the press was told is, oh, they show that Omar was in the basement, and what the test actually mm-hmm. says was, oh, we found some fibers, but they are not the ones that are in the basement. Yeah. The tests show that there are uh, fiber traces on Omar's shoes as well. Okay. That could correlate to some found in the basement. There's a possibility there. Right. And that would show that Omar was in the basement at some point in the past. Yeah. And for the prosecution, that's proof that Omar was in the basement during the murder. I mean, it's very difficult um, when, you know, when you have these kind of cases where Omar is going to be in, he's going to have traces from this house because he worked there. Well, that's exactly what he says. He says, yes, I remember now. I have been in the basement before. Uh I moved flower pots down to the basement in the past. Well, there you go. So he has been at least once in the basement, mm-hmm. and that could easily explain why he has some traces on his mm-hmm. shoes. It doesn't prove when he was in the in the basement, but the, producer, the prosecution doesn't care about that. Yeah. As far as they're concerned, if there's a possibility, it's proof. Mm. Um, in reality, it shows that, well, maybe one day he was there. It could be ages ago, but it doesn't prove that he was in the basement for the murder. So Omar's lawyer tries bail again. Right. And at that point... Uh, the hearing is on the 18th of March, 1992. So he's already been in jail for a year. It's rejected, like the first ones. However, the latest forensic tests are in favor of Omar. And that's something that happens to whole lengths of the, the story. Pretty much every single test that is done is either inconclusive or in his favor. But somehow the prosecution always manages to twist it into showing that maybe he was, the, he was guilty. So those ones, same thing, they are released on the 13th of March, but Omar and his lawyer are not notified of the results until the 9th of April. So the hearing is on the 18th, the results are released to the police on the 13th, and they forget to tell them for a month. Oh my God. So that they only get the results nearly three weeks after the hearing. Yeah, so, so they, oh, here's the scientific evidence that might help your case. Yes, exactly. And oh, we're going to withhold That it. could have helped you. Well, oh well, here oh, we go. Oh dear. <laughs> Whoops, my bad. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what's happening. Yeah. So, yeah, it does feel like somebody's trying really oh, totally. hard to make it impossible for him yeah. to, to get out of jail. Also, on the 4th of March, the gendarmerie tells the newspapers that the judge has delivered a warrant to check that Omar has stolen a gold chain from his wife and sold it for gambling money. So, they go and check. The article mentions that someone has been found called or who signed Radad, which is his surname, mm-hmm. um, during, uh, after the negotiation of the sale with a local jeweler okay. in May 1990. 1990? Exactly. When Omar says he was in Morocco. So the gendarmerie says, oh, we, we, we can't check that he was actually in Morocco because his passport has disappeared. So Didn't in, they take his passport? Well, that's the thing. In, there's two, several things that are wrong with that story. The first one is the warrant dates back from October 1991. Right. So it's not new at that point. No. It's already over six months old. Mm Mm-hmm. But it's released to the press just at the right time. Of course. A few days before the hearing. Of course. Between the 21st of October and 3rd of January, the gendarmerie checks the books of 70 jewelers (laughs) because they want to know who that radad is, where it came from. They do find the Radad selling a gold chain in 1990, uh-huh. as we said. But it's only in May 1991 that Omar's wife discovers the missing chain. Right, okay. So somebody signed Radad at a jeweler's to sell a gold chain mm-hmm. in May 1990. And the, what the gendarme is saying, that's the theft that yeah. the wife discovered a year later. Mm-hmm. And we can't 
agree that Omar was in Morocco, as he says, at the time, because his passport has disappeared. That's what they're saying. And, and, and also, I'm, I'm presuming Radad's quite a common North African name. I don't know. Um, I have no idea how common that is. It could be very common. I really don't know. No idea. I've only heard that name once. But... To, to, to me, I mean, the North African population is quite, it's higher than, than I would say the rest of the country, other than, uh, you know, around about Paris. Mm-hmm. To, to me, it just feels like utterly grasping at straws to prove that he might do some petty theft in order to feed his huge gambling habits. And as if we remember from last time, it's he, pay, he plays the, the, the slot machines, which are, you know, just cheap, and he doesn't even play them regularly. Yeah. So, and mean, also that's a story that digs back a year before mm-hmm. the murder yeah, as well. Yeah, I mean, it's just ludicrous. Which they try to tie yeah. to something that happened after the murder. Exactly. But they're, they're just ignoring time yeah. in, in there, and they try to make it everything related, Yeah. when in fact there's years in between each event. It, it, to, to me, when um, you, know, you watch true crime stuff or you're aware of, of um, how these things go, you're supposed to follow where the evidence goes, but it, it is just so obvious that the police are now just desperately trying to make it you know muddy this guy's character oh yeah, yeah totally they have decided he was guilty yeah. and now they're trying to prove it but they're the, not the, trying the, to the find the, who murdered the woman they, they just don't even seem to be paying much attention to reality at this moment no no they, they just try to prove they just try to do everything they can to yeah. prove he's guilty even if it makes it well if i was a cop at the time i would have thought that we looked ridiculous because mm. Ignoring time yeah. makes absolutely no sense. No, of course not. But that, that's what they do. And as for the passport, the, yeah. which they say has disappeared, so they can't prove it was in Morocco, they had seized it yes. when they arrested him so that he couldn't leave the country. I mean, that's So it was in their hands yeah, and it, somehow yeah. mm-hmm. conveniently disappeared. Very convenient. Very convenient, yes, because that would have been evidence because of the stamps. When mm. you go to Morocco, you get stamped. That he was in Morocco. The date I, would have been on it. I would have thought they could have gotten contact with the you know, the Moroccan aviation authorities and to just to get them as, to check the paperwork. As far as I know, that hasn't been tried. Um, I don't know. I have no idea. In fact, no, it would be the... Uh, would it be... You know, because he wouldn't have to sign any papers to get into Morocco because he's Moroccan. So, I mean, it would be... Yes, but when his, he was coming his passport back. would still be stamped. Yeah. Your passport True. is stamped yes, in yes, and yes, out yeah, of uh-huh. Morocco, so... But you, you still have to sign paperwork when you come into another country that's not your own. Not always, but for Morocco, yes. Mm-hmm. If you go to, if you move around Europe, even in the nineties, you didn't have any paperwork to do. Oh, that's but true. going in and out of Morocco, yes, everybody mm. has to get their passport stamped and yeah. numbers recorded and mm-hmm. all that, even if you're a local. Yeah. So it could have proved that he was in Morocco, no problem. Yeah. Except that they conveniently lost his passport. Of course. Later, Omar does another hunger strike for thirty-five days as okay. well, to because he requests bail. Mm. It's again refused, as usual, mm. because uh, that, that's the best bit, because the, the judge decides that his affair has disturbed the public peace, and therefore he'll be kept in jail for another year awaiting trial. Disturbed the peace? Yes. His story apparently inconvenienced people, it made too much noise, and therefore his bail request is rejected. <laughs> that's what that says. How do these judges get away with that? It's just nonsense. Uh, that's utter nonsense. Yes. <laughs> wouldn't even know how the criteria you could measure that by. No, I, I don't see what it could be. Per column inch, that, I mean, in, in the newspapers? I mean, it's just utter, utter fart. Anyway. Yeah. So now we get to the trial. Right. The actual trial. hmm So the trial starts on the 3rd of March, 1993, so it means he's been in jail for two years. Wow. He's accused of murder based on the writing on the wall. Uh, yes. He's lack of alibi because all his alibis have been lost. And the lack of breaking into the house. So they are saying the only person who could have done it is a person who had access to the house. Oh, look, who had access to the house. That's what they're saying. What? No, so it couldn't have been somebody he, it should, somebody she knew that she could have just yeah, let so, in. Somebody it was who just purely pick, just him. Yeah, or somebody who could pick lock, locks. It's not difficult to pick a house yes. lock. It's very easy. Um, also, they argue his need for money, for gambling and prostitutes. And the dust traces or traces on his shoes. Right. That proves that he was in the basement at the time of the murder. According to at, at the time the of the murder, I would have to quibble that, but yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah, definitively. 
As a result, Omar is put in a cell that is in a terrible condition, oh, no. awaiting his trial. And he says he tried to commit suicide by swallowing razor blades. Uh-huh. But the guard at the time looked at him and didn't care, walked away. Uh-huh. So he then tried to cut his wrists and managed to get take- taken to, out of the cell to hospital. Right. And then, after that, he's put in a normal cell because... It's not that he happened to be in a bad cell. They had chosen the worst cell they could find to put him in. It wasn't a normal cell. Um, nothing was working. The toilets weren't working. There was no running water. It, it was very bad, not cleaned ever. It was the worst cell they, they could possibly find, and they put him in there. That's so, savage. Yeah, when he's back from hospital, he's in a normal cell, and he's Good. happy with that. <laughs> so... Yes, they were clearly trying to punish him ahead of the time. Yeah, it's just I mean, and you would think he was some kind of, you know, it's not Gilles de Ray, for goodness sake. He hasn't raped thousands of children. He's just accused yeah. of, you know, killing a, an old lady. Yes. Hmm. So the trial, the actual trial starts on the 24th of January, 1994. Right. First, the judge tried to define Omar's personality. Mm-hmm. Well, I didn't know that they tried to do that, but anyway. Unfortunately... All the psychologists that have seen Omar are in his favor. They say he can't have done it. Right. He's not the kind of person that kills people. No. Even the gendarmes who interviewed him are in his favor. Mm -hmm. Uh, After the interviews, they say, we don't feel like that's the kind of person that goes around and kills other people. But that doesn't matter. All the witnesses that are called as as well uh, to testify uh, say Omar is a good person, he's not violent, and he's very helpful. Okay. So, again, that backfires a little bit. But it doesn't matter. The judge started his career in Algeria. Sorry? Yes, the judge started his career in Algeria, so he's probably an Algerian. Oh, that's just... So, you have an Algerian who is judging uh, a Moroccan. Moroccan. That yeah. is insane. If you know the local history, um, Algerians and Moroccans hate each other. They're yes. not good neighbours. I mean, that's... Yeah, they've been at war, at war essentially for 50 years that, so far. That is essentially having somebody who's Jewish having a Palestinian judge. Yeah, it's exactly the same it thing. It is yes. awful. It's exactly that. That is just horrendous. So, he quotes the Quran to Omar several times during mm-hmm. the trial and he uses it to question his behaviour. He, say, he says several times, oh, the Quran says you shouldn't do that. Why are you doing it? You're not a good Muslim. Okay. So he's having his dogma then. Yeah. So, for example, he says that um, he, he said, I don't know by whom, to have eaten during Ramadan. <gasps> and that's a big no-no. Oh, during the daylight. Yeah. yeah. He also says he doesn't understand why Omar is illiterate, because the Quran says you have to be literate enough to read the Quran, which is not really enforced because half of the people um, who are supposed to read it never read it. The same mm. for the Bible. And, uh, yeah. Before the 19th century, most people no. had no idea how to read the Bible and they were supposed to, but the same thing. Yes. Um, so he has that against him as well. So he's very much taking a religious judgment on Yeah, on and he this. also insists very heavily on the gambling and the prostitutes because, of course, well, it's yeah, those banned are big by no-nos. the Quran. Yeah. So I'm surprised he's not rushing over and smelling his breath. Yes, well, mm. cool, yeah. So that's roughly the atmosphere in a trial. Omar, after the trial, says that he was under the impression the whole time that the judge forgot he was supposed to decide if he had murdered Ghislaine Marshall. Yeah. And was, in fact, there to judge if he was a good Muslim. Yeah, oh, very, very That's pretty much, much what yes. happened during the trial. Yeah, well, that's terrible. So what comes out of uh, all that personality thing? Mm. Um, a large part of the trial is really spent analyzing Omar's behavior. Yeah. The main two points are that his visit to prostitutes and gambled, Mm -hmm. as we said. However, as we know, the only prostitute that testified that she had him as a client client, Mm -hmm. never actually did. No. She says it afterwards because a PI, after the trial, traced her down Uh and interviewed her. And she said that Omar never visited her. She didn't know Omar. And that when she was questioned by the gendarmerie, they made her sign her testimony mm. without letting her read it. So they, so they asked her yeah. questions, they wrote things down, and they said, sign that. Yeah. And she didn't know what she signed. 
Yeah, so it's basically we can make your life very unpleasant to sign this kind of. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, inference. essentially, yes. Yeah. yeah. She also says that she was never contacted during the trial. Okay. But during the trial, the judge says that she couldn't be found. She had disappeared. Uh huh. But she hadn't. But she tells the PI that no, she hadn't disappeared. She hadn't even moved for yeah. the last 10 years. She lived in the same flat. She was yeah. there. But nobody ever came, nobody ever called. There's, there, there's starting to be more and more questions about this trial. It, it feels very yeah. kangaroo around the. Uh, it around it, the it does, it does, because they probably knew that she would say no, mm. because they had interviewed her. So she, she had said already, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I don't know Ma, but yeah, she, yeah. they made her sign something that said she did. Yeah, she would so have. So of folded. course they didn't want her she, in the trial. She would have folded and ended up caving in and telling the truth. Well, she wasn't lying. She didn't no. want to lie. So yeah. the, the minute she had been questioned by the judge, she, she said, no, I never said, said no, that. I was made to sign a bit of paper. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Exactly. So of course they didn't want her in the trial. So we've got one false statement um, of a prostitute saying, uh, you know, he, she, he was a client. And then we also have one uh, other lady who claimed that he looked at her once. Mm-hmm. Mm. So as for gambling, mm -hmm. which is the other big thing, yeah. um, the prosecution inspected his bank accounts in France and in Morocco. Okay. And they could only conclude that Omar had lost some money at the casino, but was trying to make it back, and he was trying to hide it from his wife. Okay. And that's why he was asking for money from, uh, from Giseline and Francine. Right. So he did gamble, but I mean, he didn't make any secret of the fact he... Yeah, he and it's small sums anyway. Yeah. Um, uh, it was a very small amount of money. It just didn't, it didn't yeah. have the, the cash to hide it, so yeah. he just tried to find it somewhere else. I mean, it's just, I mean, you, you have to consider, you know, how many people, you know, put bets on horses, you know, daily or, oh, yeah. or, 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 or dogs or, or whatever. You yeah, know, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a large part of many people's you know, yeah. uh, hobbies or, or yeah. you know, past. Yeah, they are hobbies so at that point, yes. It's, it's not like he was, you know... Um, it's not into... gambling on the roulette. No, and, and it, it's not exactly as if it's, you know, that bad. I mean, it's, yeah. he's still managing to pay his, uh, his, his bills, just this one time that he isn't. Yes. Hmm. Also during the trial... Francine testifies regarding the day of the murder. Remember mm -hmm. when he came back very quick uh, after lunch and they thought he didn't have time for lunch. Yeah, he obviously was trying to get all his jobs done before yeah. he went away for the yes. weekend. So she says that if Omar had had any trace of blood yeah. on himself when he came to work in the afternoon for her, uh -huh. that her dogs would not have left him alone uh, because okay, apparently yeah. they were very keen on blood. Okay. <laughs> and they just didn't care about him more than usual. So, yeah, so she's saying just... he can't have had any yeah. trace of blood at all on, mm -hmm. on him. So clearly he didn't kill anyone, but just the, yeah. like the half hour before. I mean, the way that, that Francine and the family have rallied around uh, Omar also is very telling of his personality. He's obviously, you know, just a, a guy good at his job and unfortunately doesn't speak good French. Yeah, yeah, he seems to be very nice. Everybody says yeah. he's nice. Even mm -hmm. the cops say he was nice. So he was never complaining. He was never yeah. fighting back. He was just a nice guy. but. Yeah, yeah. Just head down, wanted to do his job yeah. and live his life. Yeah, but accused of murder. Mm. So clearly, if that's true, the dogs didn't smell any blood on him. That's right. pretty much proof that he couldn't have killed somebody a few minutes earlier. No. That's just not possible. Because no. we, as we remember, he came back to Francine's place at 10 past 1. Yes. Uh, and that was leaving, after leaving Gislin's house at about 12, uh, 12, half 12. Yeah. So he would have killed her within the last 40 minutes or yeah. something. There's no way he could have removed all the blood from him. And no. also, he had, we knew he hadn't changed his clothes. And also, can you imagine so. how, how uh, you must just be so pumped full of adrenaline and how on earth you could yeah. just calmly go to another job. Well, and that's something they said as well. When he came to Francine's place, he acted totally normal. Yeah. They didn't think he was especially hyper or stressed or no. anything. He just he was just normal. I mean, he's not a, he's not a psychopath. I mean, th that yeah. would have been picked up uh, when the psych you know the psychiatrists talked to him, and he's not. Yes. So you do not murder somebody and just go around about the rest of your day. Yeah, when unless it's your job. Happened. Unless you're a hitman, but that's about it. Yeah, but as I say, I mean, so, the psychiatrist would have picked up his yeah. psych psychopathy. Oh yeah, but well, the, the the psychologist that analyzed yeah. him said that they don't think he could no. have done it. No, no, he's not the kind of person. There you go. But. 
that doesn't stop everything. So then they looked at Ghislaine's life a little bit. Okay. Uh, she's described by her son as not only a great mother, but his best friend and confident, which is kind of creepy. Yeah. Anyway, um, her parents had been in the resistance during the war and they had been deported to a, a camp in Germany. Right. Only her mom came back. Okay. She's presented as a strong character that can be very nice, but can also be, can, can, can also exasperate people okay. because she's very demanding, but apparent, ju- apparently just and strong and courageous, according to people. And they, they, they say also that she would never have written in blood against her will mm-hmm. or under torture. So they're saying if she did write on the wall, yeah. it was of a free will. It wasn't somebody making her do it. And not with such glaring uh, grammatical errors yeah. either. I mean, vi- victimology is always so important to cases. Yeah. They don't look at her life more than that. No, they... that, to me that feels wrong. Yeah, um, that's something Omar complained about as well. He mm-hmm. said that they looked into his life like every yeah, minute my, of his time yeah, in the last should. many years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And they don't really look at her. They just ask her kid, um, is she good? Yeah, yeah, she's good. Ah, okay, then that's enough. We don't need to do anything else. Like you're that's really essentially what happened. You're going to get a really great view of somebody who's way too close to their mother. They're not going to tell you anything yeah. that you can really use. In no. a court of and they're law. not trying. They're not even no. trying to question other people or anything about her. They're not interested in her. No, no. No. So, of course, that means that there's no chance of finding any other reason why she would have been killed by someone quite, else quite, in uh-huh. her life. There is at some point discussion about her maid. Mm-hmm. She's questioned. That was the one who was paid to leave for the weekend, yes? Yes, that's the one. Mm-hmm. She mentions that on the 22nd at 10 a.m., 22nd of April. So is that the Friday? The day before the murder. Yep, Friday. Uh-huh. Gislena had received a phone call. And as a result, she gave her the time off until Tuesday. She was under the impression that Gislena was planning to go on a trip. Right, okay. What he says. Okay. Her testimony seemed to come as a surprise mm-hmm. to the court, but she had already mentioned all that to the gendarmerie, so it's kind of surprising. Yeah, but they just weren't listening at that point. I guess so, yes. The only thing is she hadn't mentioned the phone call at the time. Mm-hmm. And it seems pretty important because what was she going to do? Why did she tell the maid not to come as she normally does? Yeah. What was she planning to do? Was she planning to meet someone? What, what was going on? And because they're not interested in her life, that that's it. We won't know. They never asked anything about it. That seems vaguely crazy. It sounds totally crazy because if she had planned to be away for four days, yeah, or to do something she didn't want people around for four days, mm-hmm. what was it? Who yeah. was it with? She seems quite an enigma. Yes. Yes, they, she's described as very, very private. Even her friends don't know anything about her. Yeah. They don't know her story. They don't know who she knows. She doesn't, they don't know if she sees someone. They don't know nothing about her. She's just a complete black box. Which is tend to, that's very unusual for, for ladies of a certain age. I mean, they, they tend to like yapping about themselves and, you know, reminiscing about their past. Yeah, that is true, but she doesn't at all. Mm. That's typically the what people who don't want you to know their past do. Yeah. Or not necessarily that they've done something wrong, but they've done something that they don't want to talk about or want to forget, like yeah, my grandparents yeah. and the mm-hmm. war. They barely ever talk about it. Exactly. Or my, grandpa- my grandfathers that have been in camps in, Ger- in Germany as well. Mm-hmm. My, even my parents know nothing about it. Yeah, yeah. They know it surprising. happened, but yeah. that's it. No, and no. I'm the one, for example, from one of my grandfather, our fathers have found which camp he had been in Germany. Mm-hmm which Stalag had been in, but even my parents had never heard of it. They had no clue where it was or yeah. what regiment it was in or anything. Just it never talked about it. No. My grandmother knows a little bit about it, mm-hmm. but not a huge amount either. No. So, it's not something you want to So, yeah, either, so it? it's not necessarily that she's done something bad, no, but no. she just no, doesn't no. want to talk about exactly. it. Exactly. She's too young to have been in the war, so it's not that, but mm. it could have been something else. We yeah. don't know because they never looked. Yeah, these camps wouldn't have been pleasant places. So, yeah, that, that's very important and it's very disappointing that nobody ever followed that up. Yeah. Then they look at the alibi, Omar's alibi. Uh-huh. 
During the witness testimonies, a neighbor is questioned, and she says that she stayed on the balcony of her flat from half eleven to quarter to one on, right. on the Saturday, on the day of the murder, because she was waiting for her daughter to arrive, and she wanted to see her arrive. During that time, she says she didn't see Omar arrive on his moped. Remember, he arrived on his moped, so the manager of the casino, the oh, supermarket... Oh, yes, that's right. The, who was out the back, yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Uh, so they question that, that woman who mm-hmm. says, no, no, I was in the balcony. I never arrived. I never saw him. So, okay. Her husband confirms that it's strange that they didn't see him, but yeah. he says it's not impossible we miss him, missed him. No. It's a bit strange standing out in your balcony for an hour and 15 minutes. That's weird. It is strange, but she wanted to see her daughter arrive. So, okay, <laughs> let's assume that's true. Yeah, well. Later, she is questioned by a PI. Right. Paid by the law and the Omar's lawyers. And she couldn't explain how she managed to make lunch and stay nonstop at the balcony at the same time. So she was basically going backwards and forwards to the kitchen. Well, she can't have made lunch on the balcony, and no. therefore she can't have been all the time on the balcony, or they didn't eat on that day, but we know they had lunch. Yeah. So something is not working in that story. No, it sounds like she was kind of like var- varnished over the fact she was uh, going backwards and forwards exactly. to the kitchen. So. Also, it turns out that she had cognitive problems because she had a stroke. Before. Right, okay. So okay. really her testimony should not have been no, used. No, no. But it was used anyway to show that Omar wasn't really home at that time. No. And then there's motion and Um The legal seals on the evidence had a lot of problems during the inquiry. Okay. So one example was the blood samples that had been collected on the scene of the crime mm-hmm. are sent to a pharmacist, right. a local pharmacist, Okay. So who first doesn't have the equipment to analyze the blood? No, not so a not why? specialized lab. But to be exactly, the police yeah. have specialized labs. Mm. Why not sending them? What sent to a local pharmacy? Yeah. Who knows? But anyway, he it's strange. Couldn't have done anything with it. But not only couldn't do anything about it, but he complained that the samples that he received had been degraded and the seals had been broken. So chain of of evidence broken. Mm. The fingerprint expert right. also mentioned that they received the prints five months later and also with broken seals. It's really so that dodgy. means that evidence was collected, yeah. the seals were put on, and mm. at some point somebody broke the seals to access the evidence, but it's not recorded. We don't know who that is. Yeah. So that's not dodgy. So it could yeah. be anybody's print, anybody's blood. So yeah. of course they might find Omar's blood, but we don't know how it got there because it's no longer evidence. No. The gendarmerie in charge, the gendarme in charge was never questioned about it mm. and therefore didn't explain why the seals were broken. But uh, how could you possibly explain it anyway, apart from saying, oh, I didn't do my job? Yeah. So, I mean, you're supposed to sign things in and out of uh, law, yeah, of course. aren't you? Of course. And if the seals are broken, they have to be replaced afterwards. Yeah. So that we know that since the last time, they haven't been opened. Yeah. But no, they, they arrived at the labs broken. So they had been opened at some point. We don't know who opened them, and they hadn't been replaced. I think shoddy is... is so who is, knows what... Yeah. Is, is the least you can say. Yeah, but it also means that whatever it was is no longer evidence. Uh, yeah, it's compromised. It's just random stuff. Completely compromised. So there are a few other things um, that are kind of weird in the inquiry, but n- it doesn't look very good for the gendarmerie, no. and nobody's questioned about it. Mm. So that's the quality of evidence that they have. During the trials, the journalists that report on the case, because of course it was front page and Mm -hmm. in the news all day, every day, report that as usual the prosecution has very little evidence, that they spend a lot of time on minor and unimportant things, Mm -hmm. as if to drown the important information in a sea of nothing. Yeah. And one of the journalists says that they call it legal impressionism. <laughs> right, yes. Sketchy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the judge is also accused of taking his time and taking part in every single discussion that goes on, <laughs> as if he was trying to exhaust the jury by drowning, drowning them, them in a sea of the, irrelevant he, information yeah, as well. Yeah, totally. And he's also described as obviously having decided that Omar was guilty before the trial started. 
the judge even has the the writings on the wall uh -huh. brought into the court to show the jury. I don't understand why uh, that's necessary. But apparently, it had it made a big impression of the on the jurors. But it contained no information whatsoever no, because they had seen photos. Yeah. It had been described to them. The tests that have been done have been described to them. They really is, that yeah. gives them nothing. But seeing it in front of them yeah. apparently had a big impact, and that was obviously the purpose. Here's our big Agatha Christie moment. You know, it's just uh, oh God. yeah. Show sure, it's just um, showboating. Well, it's more than showboating. It's really trying to influence the jury's state of mind mm. with something that has no value whatsoever. I mean, it's, it's maximizing the one shaky piece of evidence that, that, yeah. that they're, they've pinned all their money on. Yes, yes, because that's the base of the case. Yes. yes. Because his name was in that writing, yes. he's guilty, and therefore here is exactly. all the evidence we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, during the trial, two jurors quit in two days. But unlike, unlike the US, these are not made public. Uh, okay. We don't know. Normally, you don't know who the jurors are and you don't know what happens yeah. because it's all secret. So nobody knows why they quit, but two of them disappeared. I'm presuming you would need a legitimate reason for, for I quitting. I would assume so because it's very hard to get out of jury duty. Yeah. So I would assume that once you're in the trial, it would be even harder to get yeah. out, but I don't know. Mm. And there's been no information published on it, so we don't know. But it's kind of weird that two people quit. Mm. Two jurors disappear out of... I don't know how many it is, actually. It might be seven or something. Mm. It's quite a lot. But anyway, there's no information. And there's another juror who's interviewed later that says that there was a very anti-Omar ambience in the jury, that those who followed the judge's opinion mm -hmm. were very, very loud, mm. and those who doubted it were very, very quiet. No. They were intimidated in not saying anything. Yeah, you, you can see what's going to happen. Oh, yeah, yeah, you can see where that's going, yes. On the 2nd of February, in the evening, Omar is sentenced to 18 years in prison. Right. Again, there's dodgy stuff happening, because why not? The judge spends six hours with the jury during their deliberation. Uh, that doesn't sound legal. I don't know how that can be, but apparently they went away to deliberate, and the judge said, I'm going to go in there, and he went in there for six hours. Oh, God, that... that, that I can't even, I just can't. You can't that, even, yeah. How is that legal? I, I don't see how that's legal. I don't understand how that could have happened. Because then it's not the jury who decides, it's the judge. Because yeah. the jury is not going to go against the judge. She's the one who is the authority. Yeah, And, and, and in and, six hours, he's going to have beaten down anybody who didn't agree with him. Yeah, exactly. And, 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 so, and which way is the Algerian judge going to lean anyway? Exactly. Well, especially one that is told in the press to have already decided before yeah. the trial started. I, I don't know. I don't know how that's possible, but that's what happened. I just don't know why uh, Omar's um, solicitor didn't push, lawyer didn't push for, um, uh, you know, a can, uh, dissolving it and asking, you know, no, not an acquittal, but just yeah. demanding another trial. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, his lawyer at the time was uh, a guy called Verges, who is a very, very, it's a media who are. Judge, um, lawyer, okay, who's done all the big, big trials in the eighties and nineties, right? And according to other lawyers, because at the time Omar had three lawyers, mm -hmm. um, he was very ineffective. He was more interested in being on TV, on TV, being than actually doing head. the job. So, okay. because he was the big lawyer, he essentially took charge, and the other two had nothing to say. Right. Okay. So that's and why. when he decided not to say anything about the fact that the judge spent so much time with the jurors during deliberation, then nothing happened. He ne never, never said anything, never filed any complaint, and that was it. <sighs> yeah. So anyway, th th that's what happened. When the trial finished and uh, everybody came out, right. his lawyer, Berges, mm -hmm. said that, uh, he said something that became famous afterwards. He said that, it is the centenary of the Dreyfus affair. A hundred years ago, an officer was sentenced because he was Jewish. Today, a gardener was sentenced because he's Moroccan. Mm. That became fairly famous. Yeah. That was a good sentence, but th that, that's pretty much all he's done during the trial. He's done really nothing. Well, he sounds like a showboater and a half. Yeah. Omar appeals. Yeah. And on the 9th of March, 1995, he's rejected. He gets on appeal. 
the last four, the last four years now he's in prison. Okay. On the 10th of May 1996, so we're talking now five years after the murder, right. the president of France partially pardons Omar. Partially. And he reduces his sentence to four years and eight months. So he's only half sorry. He's only half sorry, yeah. Um, part of the decision is due, due to pressure from the Moroccan king at the time. Okay. And it's part in exchange for some French Moroccan prisoners in Morocco. So there was some negotiations going, going okay. on. The Morocco was not happy with the trial. And well, who would be? Who would be, no. And they put pressure on France to, to get him out. And eventually they negotiated something uh, to get him so, out early. So basically he got half a pardon uh, just for political reasons and he was yes. used as a pawn. Yes. Right. He could have been freed halfway through his sentence uh-huh. at nine years. So it means that with the sentence reduction, he can hope to be freed after six and a half years, as long as he provides an address and proves employment. Okay. So that was the earliest he could have been out, in that case, was January 1998. Right. He does that. What he did? provides an address. and uh, That's his wife's address in Toulon. And the mm-hmm. justice minister accepts it. That's fine. That's your address. Okay. His employment is another story. So first of all, it's difficult to see how you can find a job from prison. Yeah, that's very true. But anyway, he does. <laughs> okay, well, good I don't for know him. how, but he does. He's a hustler. So he presents to the justice minister a job as a gardener for a rich widow in the VAR department, so not very far along okay. the coast. Oh, it makes sense. I mean, he, Well, that's mean, what he does, so why not? Yes. He's got the expertise. Exactly. Well, why look for mm-hmm. something else? He's yeah. a gardener, so he looks for a gardener job. But the justice minister decided that it was too similar to his employment at the time of the murder and therefore wasn't acceptable. Because gardening is dangerous? I don't know. I don't know what the logic is there, but that, that's what is decided. The logic is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There is no logic. So he finds a second job. Right. He finds a job as a property, property maintenance for a lawyer in right. Aix-en-Provence. Okay. It's also rejected. Why? I don't know why this one was rejected, but it was rejected as well. Well, that's not similar to gardening. It's not similar. It's for a lawyer. Um, but somehow that was not acceptable. So he had to find a third job. I still don't know how he did that. He's, he's good at finding employment. Yeah, good I don't know him. how. Yeah. Good for him. So he finds a job as a delivery guy for a meat processing plant in Marseille. Right, okay. So and he's that's a... deemed acceptable as okay. a job. So driver, okay, gardener, evil. Yeah, essentially, yes. Yeah. So all that took some time. So he gets out on the 4th of September, 1998. Right. He stayed in prison nine months. Extra. Extra, because he had to spend time tr- trying to find three jobs. Everything about this, in Omar's case, has just been so appalling. Yes. So, so appalling. Yeah, and the prison guard said that he was a very good uh, prisoner, exemplary. Um, he was a good dude. In I mean, uh, if it was me, I would be so angry and bitter about everything. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know. But somehow, he's not. So now, let's go even more crazy. Okay, like it's not crazy enough. Yeah, you might think it was crazy until now, but no. <laughs> Fasten the seatbelt. It's going to get interesting. On the 2nd of February 2000, six years after Omar um, was sentenced, mm-hmm. the government organized organization that reinvestigates criminal convictions requests new inquiries, in particular with the graphology and the writing on the wall. Right. Um, mm-hmm. Regularly, the, the law about re-examining sentences changes, and mm-hmm. every time they essentially revisit a whole bunch of cases yeah. that could possibly fall under the new rules. Yeah. So the organization that decides what cases could be in the reinvestigated uh-huh. tells the court that is supposed to reinvestigate that they should look at this one again. Mm-hmm. On the defense requests, there's new DNA testing done mm-hmm. on the blood marks. And on the beam that is supposed to have been used to hit Juslein on, on, Juslein on the head. Oh, yes. Yeah, so pre, pre-stabbing her in the neck. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So all that happens. Mm-hmm. The graphology uh, report says that the writing is not Gislaine's. They're now 
formal that it, it can't have been hers. See so that, she didn't write on the wall. That's the problem with this whole uh, writing analysis thing. It's yes. so open to interpretation. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm. But nobody was taking it seriously at that point anyway, anyway. No, I mean, it's such a, you know, it's not hard science. It's not no. hard science. No, no, it's not hard science. But anyway, the, the latest one, no, the pre- remember the previous two experts said they couldn't possibly interpret it because the conditions between yeah. the reference, which was yes. letters to friends, mm-hmm. and writing on the wall what she was getting stabbed yeah. are such different that Medium, you, you can't yeah. possibly mm. compare the writing. So they said, no, we can't. No. The new, te- new experts say, yes, we can, and it's not hard. No, it doesn't. So. I mean, you're talking about it's not writing in the same medium. It's not even writing on the same plane, for goodness sake. No, no, one's no, no. Done, one's totally done, different. done horizontally and one is done, you know, vertically. Yes. The DNA test on all three pieces of evidence uh-huh. mixed with the victim's blood, right, which they say means that it can't have been contamination right, no, by okay. the mm-hmm. cops later on because it's inside the blood of the it, victim right. so it has to have been there at the same time okay. uh, they are published on the 20th of February 2001 right? and they show that there is no DNA from Omar in there Okay. but they find some other DNA and they can't tell who that is I think uh, I've read cases where um, m- multiple D- DNA uh, samples that have been kind of like mixed in with each other are very, very difficult. And I think only now, kind of like in the past five years or something, they're they're now starting to kind of like find it a bit easier. So yeah, I c- I can see why. But I mean that completely exonerates oh, totally. Omar completely. It, I mean, totally it, because it means that there was someone there yeah. that was not Omar that has left DNA mm-hmm. in the victim's blood. Yeah. So therefore, was there at the time of the murder, and we don't know who that is. But it's not Omar. That's what we know. I mean, in my eyes, it should be currently at this moment in time, Omar has been given a large amount of money and a massive pardon and everybody should be shamefaced. But I, I don't know. I've got a funny feeling that's We're not, not there what, yet, no. what you're going to tell us. So as a result, the organization that decides to re-examine the, the cases, cases mm-hmm. notifies the revision court that mm-hmm. they have to look into it because yes. there's new evidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The revision court rejects the request on the 20th of November 2002 because the new evidence, according to what they say, isn't likely to change the outcome of the trial. Uh, Except, yes, it is. Yeah. uh, So new DNA that wasn't found during the inquiry that belongs to people who are not Omar, that don't contain Omar's DNA, mixed in the victim's blood, so therefore were there at the time of the murder, it's not going to change the outcome of the murder. That's what they're saying. Oh, that's just nonsense. That's utter nonsense. Of course it is. Of course. It's just the justice system not liking to admit the fact that oh, they yeah. were wrong. Yeah, exactly. They don't want to admit that they did something wrong, that yeah. the, the whole inquiry was done badly, that the trial was oh, a joke. Just so therefore, they're just going to refuse to look into it. It's just an utter stitch up, really. Yeah. So Omar puts pressure on the justice minister to get the DNA profiled. Yeah, that DNA that quite. they don't know who that is. Yeah. Um, the Justice Minister agrees to to have it tested, mm-hmm. but on the 29th of June 2011, so yeah. you know, a long time later, yeah, yeah. the tribunal writes a report mm-hmm. saying that the they can't profile the DNA and they can't do anything with it. It's too degraded. Mm, okay. The tribunal, however, admits that the DNA, probably coming from sweat, comes from unknown males. Right. And the fact that they were found in very distinct places, rules out contamination with the John Amory. That's all they admit. And okay. they say, court, case closed. In 2013, two years later, under pressure from the defense lawyer again, so it's a woman at that point, okay. he changed lawyer. And it's backed by several genetics experts mm-hmm. who have been asked to look at it and yeah. have an opinion about mm-hmm. it. The justice minister agrees for a new DNA collection in the in the writing, right, and profile the DNA that they find in there. Okay, so it's put in the French equivalent of Codis, right. But after that, nobody knows what happened. It just it dies there. So it's put into Codis and just left there. Then, well, the French equivalent of Codis. The defense lawyer gets no feedback whatsoever. Nobody hears about any results. Nobody knows anything. It just. It stops. It's everything. It's about, just gone. It's everything point. about this case just utterly dodgy. Yes. 
<laughs> so nobody knows what happened to the results. We don't know if there's any match in Codis. We know well, in the equivalent of Codis. We, we know nothing. It just it never happened. That's crazy. So in 2014, yeah. a year later again, after the law on reinvestigation of criminal convictions is changed again, uh-huh. the defense lawyer requests again new DNA collection. Right. In 2016, <sighs> DNA later. tests show that the DNA belongs to four males. Right. None of them Omar. Okay. So now we know that not only it wasn't Omar that was there, it was four dudes that were there. Right. Four different people yes. have left DNA in her blood. None of them Omar. None of them Omar. In 2019, Omar's lawyer requests once again that the trial be reopened. Yes. And in insane. 2021, the yes. case is finally officially reopened. <sighs> that was last year. Yeah. But there's more. No, there can't be more, surely. No, now that's the crazy shit. Okay. Because in March 2022, so last month, right. a journalist and a writer reveal that in 2002, there was a secret inquiry that ran for two years, and it was run by a cell of the gendarmerie, and they looked into the murder. So this is a black ops. It is a total, total black ops. Nobody knew it was going on. Right. It took place at the same time Omar was appealing his conviction, mm-hmm. and the court wasn't aware of it. Right. So the lawyers weren't aware of it. The gendarmerie itself wasn't aware of it. Okay. The judge wasn't aware of it. Absolutely nobody was aware of that secret inquiry. According to it, a witness told the gendarmerie that Omar wasn't the murderer. But in fact, a group of Serbian gangsters were the killers. So we're talking about a group of four yeah. Serbs. Yes. For wow. weeks, witnesses are questioned, and the holes in the own, original inquiry are highlighted by that secret inquiry. In the I mean, report. And this just looks like a piece of Breton lace that has that many holes in it. Yes. One of the facts misrep- misrepresented by the original case was the wounds on Gisland. Mm-hmm. They were described as wounds Omar would have inflicted by rage oh, after Jason refused to lend him money. Okay. But according to the gendarmerie's investigation, they are consistent with torture that the right. gang would have inflicted on Jason to make her talk. Okay. And in a way, it makes way more sense. Yes. Because if you think about, for example, the small wound on the thigh. Yes. To check if she was dead, mm. what would Omar do that? Yeah. If you're going to stab someone to you death, you just leave. If you have a doubt, you stab more. Yeah, true. You just do a, not don't do a small thing no. that is not going to kill her, mm. just to confirm if she's dead or not. Mm. If you want to kill her, you just stab more. Mm. That made no sense. Now it makes sense. Yeah. If you torture yeah. her to make her talk, and somehow she goes, <laughs> yeah, and you're not sure far. she died, yeah, yeah. you're going to do something that is mm. not going to kill her, just mm. in case. Yeah, yeah. And that's what you do. You do something if you're a hunter that hunters do not to yes. damage the, uh, the prey yes. to confirm dead or alive. Mm-hmm. Now it makes sense. Yes. And I bet those four Serbs went hunting. Most likely, yes. Yeah. So, so that completely changes the, the, the story. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the problem is, of, of course, is with... Because of the, they didn't go down the road of the victimology. They didn't really research no. this old lady's background. No, exactly. And they didn't really try to find any, any wound or any thing that would go against the story that it's Omar that yeah. did it. So mm-hmm. if they find a wound and it's not consistent with killing, yeah. they just ignore it. Yeah, and that's yeah. what they did. But you shouldn't because no. small things can completely change your view of the case. So anyway, after two years, that secret inquiry ran for two years, okay. the gendarme in charge wrote a report to the justice minister. And in there, in substance, he says that there's substance to the allegations uh-huh. and the inquiry should be continued to find out who these people are. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The justice minister never followed it. He just received the report, put it in a, put it in a drawer and forget, forgot about it. That, and that was the end of the story or that secret inquiry, until it was unearthed last month by a journalist and a writer. Wow. So if this inquiry is right, the theory of the criminal gang involvement, completely dismissed by the gendarmerie at the start, because Omar was the murderer, 
would be right. And that raises a lot of questions about Ghislaine. Yes. What did she have that four Serb gangsters would want? How would four gangsters know about it? Who else does she know yeah. that would have contacted these people? There's, there's been assumptions uh, from the start that she had loads and loads of money, but it's not here. Um, they suspect it's in, Swi- in Switzerland somewhere. Okay. So they were maybe that's what for, they were after. Yeah, were they looking for account numbers? Exactly, maybe. Yeah. Did they get them? Mm. And there's a whole bunch of questions. Now, it's a completely different story. Well, yeah. I if mean, that's right. And I, I, think, I think for me, one of the most important pieces of information that should have been checked is who did she receive that phone call from? Exactly. That's, that would that be easy to find. That instigated her, you know, being on her own without her maid. Yeah. Well, that the time it could have been a public phone box if it existed. So it could have been that. Yeah, that's true. But, it but is, anyway, still, yes. Th- the whole thing just utterly. They should look into it, yes. Really does. So where does that leave us now then? The, the, well, they well, should have tried to find out what she was planning to do over that mm-hmm. weekend that she didn't want the maid around. Yeah. So... Given that Omar was there on Saturday morning, mm-hmm. she when obviously was planning to do something afterwards. Yeah. So from Saturday lunchtime to Tuesday, she was planning to do something and she didn't want anyone around. Mm-hmm. What was that? Well, we, yeah. They uh, should really look into it. Yeah. But anyway, um, it also raises questions about how the inquiry was run and also about the, ju- the justice ministers that... Um, yeah were in place since oh, yeah. 1991. Yeah, they should be. Because there's a lot that they have done that was really, really dodgy. Oh, yeah. That, they should really be made to answer that. Is that Shirax? One of Shirax? Then? No, no. Well, at the time, the first one, yes. Mm-hmm. But then it's when it, well, it went until now. So every justice minister since... Since then. To 1991 yeah. has had some involvement mm-hmm. at some point with that. How did they not do anything? Especially the one that received the report oh, yeah. in 2002 saying, yeah. we don't think Omar is the killer. Yeah. We think it's for sub dude. Mm. We think that she was tortured. Yeah. We need to look into it more. And he buried it. I don't know. I didn't check who was the justice minister at the time, but that guy should be responsible for something. Oh, yeah, definitely. So Definitely. Anyway, plus we now have DNA as well. Mm. What yeah. happened to the, yeah. the database? Uh, check yeah. with that DNA. Exactly. That was what never, did it die? Yeah, yeah. What happened there? Did they find something? They didn't yeah. want people to did know? They, what yeah, was the yeah. going on? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So there's a lot of questions that need to be answered now. That's pretty much it at the moment because that was last month. Mm-hmm. There has been no, nothing else happening since. Yep. But clearly something should happen and it really, really looks like Omar has nothing to do with it. He was just a scapegoat. Oh yeah, and yeah. he just couldn't get to get out of the trap that was there. Yeah, and that's it. Exactly. So here we go. That's the end of the Omar Radan yeah. affair. And I think w- what shows you that sometimes Occam's razor is blunt, and sometimes the most obvious answer that's written in blood isn't right. <laughs>